So I bet you guys thought I was done with this iceberg train, huh? Well, of course not. These iceberg videos are low key, very fun to make and very fun to watch. Disneyland, that's right, the park in California, has a lot of very interesting stuff going on and since we all praise our mouse overlords with our every living breath watching every single TV show, every single piece of media, consuming whatever content they make, I thought it would be great to go over the Disneyland iceberg together. Y'all already know what an iceberg is, I just like to have this scroll down so you guys can see what we're about to get ourselves into. I mean, just look at all of those entries, man. God. I can't wait to see how this whole thing ends up cause ooh man that is a lot of stuff to go over. Now enough of me rambling, let's get into the Disneyland Iceberg Explained, y'all are gonna love this one. Hidden Mickeys are a representation of the Mickey Mouse symbol, you know, the two ears and the big head. If you see one of those you think to yourself, hey that looks like Mickey Mouse? Well it is Mickey Mouse. They are usually hidden, well, rather plainly hidden in plain sight at the Walt Disney Parks and Resorts, most commonly found on attractions while you're walking through the line, some of the storefronts, they shape their stuff to be in the shape of a hidden Mickey. There was an episode of George Lopez called George Goes to Disneyland where there was a contest held and whoever found the most hidden Mickeys would win a trip to Disneyland. And in the game Kingdom Hearts 3, there's an emphasis placed on them. They're called Lucky Emblems instead, but basically you would go and find it, take a picture of it in game, and it'd be used to unlock stuff such as the game's secret ending. Tony Baxter is the former Senior Vice President of Creative Development at Walt Disney Imagineering and he was responsible for a lot of designs of the rides throughout the park such as Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, Star Tours, Splash Mountain, the Indiana Jones Adventure. He was even responsible for some of the building of Disneyland Paris and remodeling Fantasyland and Tomorrowland in Disneyland. He actually first worked as an ice cream scooper in Disneyland in 1965 at the age of 17, and as the years progressed as he went to college, he began to get noticed by the Walt Disney Imagineering Group and eventually grew through the ranks and became the senior vice president. In 2013, he announced that he'd be stepping down from his role as vice president, and now he remains as a creative advisor and a mentor to the new generation of Imagineers that are hired by Disney. Mark Davis was an American artist and animator for the Walt Disney Animation Studios. He is best known for being the man who drew Cruella de Vil, Maleficent, Tinkerbell, and Cinderella. He even worked on a couple of rides at Disneyland, such as A Haunted Mansion and The Pirates of the Caribbean. Davis passed away on January 12, 2000 at the age of 86, and his works are still being remembered even to this day. Club 33 is a private dining club where the rich and famous go to on their trips to Disneyland so that the crowds don't overwhelm them and they have a place to relax. Pictures are not allowed but a couple of them get leaked every now and then and you can take a guess on how it looks. It is a very good looking club. You can tell that it's one of the places where yeah, the rich and famous would go and it's one of two places in Disneyland that actually serves alcoholic beverages. In 2014, there was a remodel of Club 33, so some of these pictures might be outdated, so this is your only chance to really get an idea of what it might look like. There is rumored to be a 14 year waiting list for new memberships, so you guys have plenty of time to save up your money for when the time comes. Captain Eel was a science fiction film shown at the Disney theme parks from 1986 to 1998. The movie stars Michael Jackson, was written by George Lucas, and directed by Francis Ford Coppola. The movie tells the story of Captain EO heading to a planet to deliver a gift to their supreme leader. Captain EO and his crew get captured, but they escape by using the power of dance and song, and at the end of the movie, everybody's all happy and stuff, they do some dance, basically kind of like a small musical kind of deal. The show ended in 1998, but in 2009, soon after Michael Jackson's death, Disney brought the show back in place of Honey, I Shrunk the Audience, named Captain EO Tribute. It was the same exact show, except this time it had tribute in the title. On December 6, 2015, the last showing of Captain EO was shown, and since then it has not been seen in any of the Disney parks. I was lucky enough to catch this show about two times when me and my family went to Epcot a couple years ago. Now it's gone. I remember enjoying it a lot, but it's kind of weird knowing that I saw something that not a lot of people my age saw now, and the only way to see it is through a lot of bootleg copies on YouTube, or maybe the eventual full release that you might find whenever it happens. The People Mover was an attraction that was opened on July 2nd, 1967 in the Tomorrowland at Disneyland Resort in Anaheim, you know, the California one. It was a simple attraction that does as it says, it moved people on a predetermined track around Tomorrowland. The ride was closed on August 21st, 1995 to make way for its short-lived successor, the Rocket Rods, 
and the whole track still remains standing empty as of today on 2021. Partners is the copper statue you walk by at the Magic Kingdom parks or any Disneyland park that shows Walt and Mickey holding hands, with Walt pointing outwards as if to show, look at my creation. It was made by Blaine Gibson, who is known for making the face molds for the Haunted Mansion attraction, as well as Pirates of the Caribbean. Currently, there are five partner statues located throughout the Disneyland parks. Disneyland Resort, Walt Disney World Resort, Tokyo Disneyland, Walt Disney Studios, and Disneyland Paris. Griffith Park is said to be the location where Walt Disney came up for the idea of Disneyland. He saw his two daughters playing on a carousel and thought to himself, why can't all the family have fun and not just the children? And now we all know what Disney is today, so thank you Griffith Park for making one of the most powerful, popular, multinational corporations the world has ever seen, possibly ever. Black Sunday is referred to the very first day Disneyland opened on July 17th, 1955. The reason it is called Black Sunday because of a lot of things that went on behind the scenes and during the park that led to it being extremely crowded and the overall day was just very punishing. For example, ticket scammers were selling fake tickets on the outside of the gates, the employees didn't realize what was going on so they let in a bunch of people that didn't buy tickets to begin with. Some people were scaling the walls to get into the park, the worst local traffic jam in history along the Santa Ana freeway happened, thousands of guests were coming to the park, the three restaurants were slammed, the water fountains didn't work, and women in heels kept getting stuck in the freshly laid asphalt which was melting in the 100 degree heat. Basically, everything that could have gone wrong went wrong, and yet the park was still a massive success and we all know how it's going today. Haunted Mansion Holiday is a seasonal overlay of the Haunted Mansion attraction at Disneyland and Tokyo Disneyland that blends the settings and the characters of the original Haunted Mansion with Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas in the mix. The attraction tells the story of Jack Skellington visiting the Haunted Mansion on Christmas Eve, trying to bring Christmas cheer in his own twisted way. The Haunted Mansion would close in late August for the renovations, and from September to January you're able to ride the ride at Disneyland and Tokyo Disneyland, not Walt Disney World as some people might think. Bob Gurr is an American amusement park ride designer and an Imagineer. His most famous works was for Walt Disney's Disneyland and its subsequent sister parks. Gurr is said to have designed most, if not all, of the ride vehicles at the Disneyland attractions, including the Haunted Mansion and the Matterhorn bobsleds. The Sherman Brothers were an American songwriting duo made up of Robert and Richard Sherman. Their most famous works include Mary Poppins, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, The Jungle Book Except for the Bare Necessities Song, Happiest Millionaire, Charlotte's Web, and The Aristocats. They also wrote theme park songs such as There's a Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow and It's a Small World After All. Robert Sherman passed away on March 6, 2012, leaving Richard as the only remaining person of the duo. The e-ticket was a type of admission ticket used at Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom parks before 1982, which admitted the person to the newest, most advanced, or popular rides at the parks. Back when Disneyland opened, you would pay for your entry to the park, but then you would also have to pay for tickets to each ride, such as the way carnivals work today. The e-ticket was the highest tier from A through E, meaning that if you had an e-ticket you could ride the newest, most advanced, or popular rides like I said before. The ticket system started to slowly fade away after competition from Six Flags Magic Mountain, which opened in 1971, allowed its visitors unlimited use of its attractions with the purchase of a park entry ticket. By June of 1986, the ticket system disappeared completely and is now used by the present day system of buying a park entry ticket, you get to ride all the rides. The audio animatronics are the robot animatronics you see throughout your visits to Disney World. They are first created by the Walt Disney Imagineering Group, meaning that this type of audio animatronic was the first of its kind. You know the robot animatronics you see in the Haunted Mansion and Pirates of the Caribbean? These are what the audio animatronics consist of. In 2009, Disney created an interactive version of it called the Autonomatronics, and in 2018, Disney Imagineering revealed they had made something they called Stuntatronics, which has recently been revealed at the Avengers Campus at Disney California Adventure. Plot Coates was a Disney animator who worked on movies such as Snow White, Fantasia, Cinderella, and Peter Pan. He also worked on rides such as The Haunted Mansion and Pirates of the Caribbean like I keep mentioning. Coates passed away on January 9th, 1992 at the age of 78, and his works will be remembered for many more years to come. Now there are three current versions of the FastPass system available at the Disney parks. There is FastPass, MaxPass, and FastPass Plus. 
Fast Pass is the basic system where you get to the park, you go to a kiosk to a ride, you get a ticket called a Fast Pass ticket that says between the times of 1 to 2 p.m. you go in the Fast Pass line for this ride. Simple enough. Max Pass is the version of Fast Pass that is only available at Disneyland, the California one, in which you can basically get your Fast Pass tickets on your phones and any pictures taken throughout the park you can save them on your phone. That's it. Instead of going into the park to get your physical ticket, you can get it on your phone and use it that way. FastPass Plus is a FastPass system only available to the parks in Walt Disney World, where instead of having to go into the park to get your tickets, or having to go to the park then do it on your phone like a Max Pass, you're able to reserve your FastPass ticket 60 days in advance. It is very confusing to go through the three, and even when I went to the parks a couple years ago with my family, we were still very confused by the fact that there were three options available, yet one was only in California and one was only available in the Florida parks. I do suggest looking it up yourself in case you plan on going to the parks as there's a lot of little differences between the three and let's face it, it's hard to remember three different versions of the same basic function. Paul Freeze was a voice actor who voiced for various Disney projects. He is best known for being the voice of the unseen ghost host at the Haunted Mansion attraction at Disneyland and Disney World. He also voiced some of the audio animatronic pirates in the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. On November 2nd, 1986, at the age of 66, Paul Freeze died of heart failure, but his works will be remembered for years to come. Dole Whip is a type of ice cream that was introduced by the Dole Food Company in Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room. You make it with a scoop of ice cream, some pineapple juice, and some crushed up pineapple all mixed together. Since 2013, Dole Whip has been made with exclusively vegan ingredients and has always been gluten free. I've never had it myself, but I like ice cream, I like pineapple, so it probably tastes really good. Remain seated please, permanece sentados por favor, was a safety spiel heard on the Matterhorn bobsleds ride by Jack Wagner, the announcer. Remain seated please, permanecer sentados por favor. It's one of the more famous lines heard in Disney history and is actually heard for a second in Toy Story 2 by the Barbie doll. Remain seated please, permanecer sentados por favor. The Country Bear Jamboree is an extremely popular attraction located at Magic Kingdom in Tokyo Disneyland and was a former attraction at Disneyland, the California one. The show was originally intended for Disney's Mineral King Ski Resort, but the plans fell through. The head Imagineer of the project, Mark Davis, planned on making it go through, so they moved it to Disneyland where it became extremely popular. On September 9th of 2001, nearly 30 years after it was first introduced in Disneyland, it was closed for the last time, and in 2002 there was even a movie called The Country Bears, which was based off the attraction and its characters. The Main Street Windows refers to the windows on the Main Street of course, which have the names of prominent people throughout the Disney history. For example, Elias Disney, Walt and Roy Disney's father, Walt Disney, Roy Disney, and some other people such as Bob Gurr. These names are just a fraction of the others that are listed on Main Street throughout the Disney parks. Harold is the name of the animatronic Yeti located on the Matterhorn bobsleds ride. On January of 2015, the ride went under refurbishment, and when it reopened on May of that same year, Harold was also updated as well. Walt Disney Imagineering is where the magic happens. These are the people that create all the rides, animatronics, everything having to do with Disney, the Disney parks. All the ideas go through these people, and they design everything. It was formed in 1952 with the task of designing Disneyland, and since then they've been designing everything having to do with any Disney park. Illustrators, architects, engineers, light designers, show writers, and graphic designers. If you have some sort of skill, some sort of passion for making things, Walt Disney Engineering is something you should have on your list. Inventions was a two-story exhibit in Tomorrowland at Disneyland where it basically showed off near-future technologies. Some of the attractions include the Kitchen of the Future and the Office of the Future. I very vaguely remember going into this, but I remember it was just for basically an AC break and nothing more because most of the stuff that was shown as the future was outdated. They did have this cool Xbox route at one point though, which I wasn't able to use. If I was able to use that, I would have had a blast at Disneyland. Around 2013, the Intervention Center turned into more of a meet and greet for Star Wars and Marvel characters, and in 2015, it closed officially. Only a year later did Disney close the superhero meet and greets as well, in 2016. Jungle Cruise jokes I believe refers to the fact that the whole Jungle Cruise itself is one giant joke I would say. It's more lighthearted than anything. Originally when it opened to Disneyland on release date, it was actually more of a serious ride until 1962 when they decided to change it up a bit. 
The ride itself is ad-libbed by the cast member who controls the boat, so lots of the jokes that go on really depends on what the cast member says, but I know I've had a couple of experiences with me and my family where we say some pretty good jokes that makes the cast member laugh. Fantasy in the Sky was the very first fireworks show at Disneyland beginning in 1958. Walt Disney wanted a fireworks show at night to keep guests entertained at night and provide some much needed entertainment. The show was an immediate hit and ran all the way up until 1996 where it was replaced with other fireworks show but still showed itself every now and then such as in 2004 and 2015. Space Mountain Ghost Galaxy is a Halloween theming of Space Mountain that would happen every year from 2009 all the way up until 2018 at Disneyland. Starting in 2009 during Halloween, the ride visuals would be changed to resemble a more Halloween theming like you would imagine, and was overall a very big hit with people. The same idea also applies with Hyperspace Mountain, where it was a Star Wars themed overlay rather than Halloween, and it would happen every year starting from 2015 all the way up until January of 2020. As you would imagine, it's Star Wars themed instead of Halloween themed, and it was also a huge hit with people. There's no telling when either will be brought back as certain circumstances have caused theme park companies to be a lot more weary with where their money goes, to put it lightly. Don't be surprised, however, if both of them come back rather soon. Contrary to popular belief, Walt Disney's head was not frozen cryogenically and placed under Pirates of the Caribbean. He was actually cremated and buried at Forest Lawn Memorial Park. Don't get me wrong, it does sound like a pretty cool thing, and it does sound knowing how Walt Disney is, he was very looking toward the future, so it's not something out of the box, but it never happened, and since he was cremated, there's no way to get his head and place it on a robot or whatever in the future. Videopolis was a sort of nightclub themed show that started taking place in 1985, soon after Disney's newest CEO Michael Eisner took his office. The nightclub theming had been meant to appeal to young teenagers and boy did it do good, as it was one of the most popular attractions at Disneyland all the way up until its closure in 1989. The reason it closed so early into its lifetime had to do with a lot of gang related fights at the Disneyland parking lot because, you know, teenagers and gang activities. 35 years ago, teenagers acted the same way they do today. However, that wouldn't be the last that we'd see of Videopolis. The theater in Discoveryland at Disneyland Paris is actually named Videopolis, and it was planned that for the first four months of 2020, Disneyland would have Videopolis as its sort of comeback show with a bunch of little tiny shows in between that such as Pixar Night. While the comeback was much more short-lived than people anticipated, it was still very popular, so they'll probably try to do it once again once everything becomes normal. Alright, now this one's pretty cool. During the promotion of Pirates of the Caribbean Dead Men Tell No Tales, instead of having the usual Jack Sparrow animatronic at Disneyland, they got Johnny Depp to dress in character and entertain people as the real Jack Sparrow. Great marketing move and I can only imagine being one of the people riding the ride not knowing that the real Johnny Depp, the real Jack Sparrow, was literally just moments away. In June of 2015, Disney outright banned the use of selfie sticks in all their parks, citing health and safety concerns. Fast forward 6 years later and they are still banned from all Disney parks, meaning that they're probably not going to get unbanned anytime soon, so sorry for you selfie aficionados. In the Mount of the Matterhorn bobsled slides, as they were building it, they installed an indoor basketball court. Just a backboard, a hoop, and a basketball. A recent TikTok video even shows that the basketball court is still there, albeit updated to match the more modern basketball hoops. The 1964 New York World's Fair is mostly remembered for a lot of innovations by Walt Disney himself. For example, prototypes of It's a Small World, the Carousel of Progress, and the People Mover system were shown to all the people who went. There were rumors after the fair that Disney would use these ideas in a Disneyland park on the East Coast that never came to fruition, instead moving everything over to Disneyland back in California. Only a couple years later when Walt Disney World opened in Florida did these ideas come to full fruition. As you walk into Disneyland, if you look up to your left right before you get to Main Street USA, you will see the apartment that Walt Disney was living in whenever he was working on Disneyland. The reason the apartment was built is because Disney was working on Lady and the Tramp as well as the Disneyland park at the same time, and it became a hassle for him to go from his house, to the semi-completed park, to the studio in Burbank, and then back to his house. The apartment was made as his home away from home, as he didn't have to drive all the way back to his house if he was very tired after working at Disneyland, and at the same time it made his job a lot easier, and even now it's seen as one of those secret attractions or whatever you want to call it by some people. The Dapper Dans are a barbershop quartet that perform around Disneyland, 
Walt Disney World, and at Hong Kong Disneyland from 2005 to 2008. While normally the group performs as a quartet, they do have up to 12 singers at each park, allowing them to have multiple running at once or combining them to form a large ensemble. At Magic Kingdom specifically, they're always found around Main Street USA toward the front entrance, so you'll walk by them for sure whenever you visit the park. As mentioned before, the Carousel of Progress was first seen at the 1964 New York World's Fair and was officially opened on July 2nd, 1967 in Disneyland. The ride had very small differences from the World Fair version, with the main differences being different colors and aesthetics. It was opened all the way up until 1973, where it was starting to see declining sales and so they decided to move it to Walt Disney World in Florida. The ride was taken apart and shipped over to Walt Disney World, where it was officially opened in 1975. The ride has been open there since, with occasional moments where it would be closed for an extra long period of time, mainly for refurbishment. The ride that replaced the Carousel of Progress in Disneyland was called America Sings, and only 9 days after it opened, there was a terrible accident. 18 year old hostess Deborah Stone was accidentally crushed to death between two walls of the building between 10.35pm and 10.40pm. As the stationary and rotating wall came to a close to each other, Stone either fell, stepped backwards, or tried to jump from one stage to the other as it began to move forward, and she was caught in between and unfortunately crushed. Her death was shortly pronounced thereafter at 11pm. Her family sued for the death of their daughter and got a small settlement in return, and Disney stepped up the safety in the area, installing lights where all the walls meet each other, as well as making the walls able to break away in case something were to happen like that again. On January 5th, 2015, the California Department of Health was notified about a suspected measles case. As they looked into the case, they discovered that a lot of people who got measles all went to Disney around the same time period, which caused a little bit of public backlash. It wasn't Disneyland's fault however, it was just the people who got sick, most of them didn't have a measles vaccination, or got one years before where the one they got didn't really do much at all. All that Disney had to do was that it was spread throughout the Disneyland park and lots of other people started getting sick around the country. Oh man, I love this story. Okay, so Doritos originated at Disneyland. In the early 1960s, they had a surplus of tortillas at the Casa de Fritos restaurant, so they would cut up the tortillas, fry them, and add basic Mexican seasoning. The vice president of marketing of Frito-Lay Arch West happened to notice their popularity, and he struck a deal with the food supplier to make these chips outside of the park. At first, they were sold regionally, but were overwhelmed by the volume, and by 1966, the first Dorito chip was released, and I mean, we all know how Doritos are now. Spicy Nacho is hands down the best flavor, by the way. Discovery Bay was an unbuilt land for Disneyland designed by Tony Baxter in the late 1970s, and would have been set in a technologically advanced late 1800s San Francisco, with attractions based off 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and the island at the top of the world. There were many proposed rides and even a whole land-built map drawn out, but things fell apart after the failure of the island at the top of the world, so the entire project was shelved. Honey, I Shrunk the Audience was the theater show that replaced Captain EO based off the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids film series. Now I won't go into much detail on the whole plot of the film because it's actually really entertaining, you guys can find it on YouTube yourselves, but basically, the audience gets shrunk and then they're brought back to their normal size. I very vaguely remember this show as a kid, I remember it was very cool to see the whole shrinking thing, plus it was also called AC, and during a hot summer day in the middle of Florida, AC is literally the choice of life or death. This show was ironically replaced by the show IT replaced. After Michael Jackson died, Captain EO saw a bit of a revival on the internet, and Disney capitalized on that by bringing the show back for a little bit. I find it quite ironic that Honey I Shrunk the Audience replaced Captain EO, and then Captain EO replaced Honey I Shrunk the Audience. Nonetheless, it was a great show, and saved six year old me from the humid hell that is the Florida weather. Speaking of shrinking people, Adventure Through Inner Space was an attraction that simulated people shrinking to the size of an atom. The ride was opened in 1967 all the way up until 1987 when it was replaced with Star Tours. None of my family rode the ride ever, but a family friend who's big into Disney, I asked him about it if he remembered anything. The only thing I remembered is that it was like the Haunted Mansion with the way the ride system was, and that it was cold. It so closely resembles the Haunted Mansion that they even have the same voice actor Paul Frees that I mentioned earlier as the announcer of the entire ride, so similar rides, similar people running them. Now back when the Haunted Mansion first opened in Disneyland in 1969, there was an effect called the Hatbox Ghost where basically the ghost's head would appear in a box and then appear right back on the head, scaring the audience or whatever. 
The effect, however, was removed shortly after the attraction's debut because it wasn't convincing enough. It wouldn't be brought back for another 45 years until they finally reintroduced it to the attraction in 2015. The Skyway was a gondola lift attraction at Disneyland, the Magic Kingdom, and Tokyo Disneyland. It would take people back and forth from Fantasyland and Tomorrowland. The one at Disneyland was closed in 1994 due to metal fatigue and they wouldn't be able to work to fix it due to the location of the supports. In 1998, the Tokyo Disneyland version was closed to make room for another attraction. In 1999, Magic Kingdom closed their Skyway just cuz, no reason, probably due to diminishing people using the actual ride. Almost 20 years later, Disney revived the Skyway idea in its modern take called the Disney Skyliner. It is located at Walt Disney World Resort and connected some of the hotels to Epcot and Hollywood Studios. The Swiss Family Treehouse was a treehouse attraction opened on Disneyland in November 1962 based off the hit adventure movie Swiss Family Robinson. The attraction was seen as a bit of a head scratcher by some of the Imagineers as no one really thought whether people would like the idea of climbing up a bunch of trees, but ended up being super popular when it came out and for more than 36 years it was around at the park. In June of 1999, it was changed into Tarzan's Treehouse for the upcoming release of the new Tarzan movie, where it still stands today. The Main Street Electrical Parade is a nighttime parade show that's been going on and off since the 1970s when it was first introduced. It was first shown in 1972 at Disneyland, then 1977 at Magic Kingdom, 1985 at Tokyo Disneyland, 1992 at Disneyland Paris, and 2001 at Disney California Adventure. The show features lots of floats with flashy pretty lights, so people are gonna love it. The show has been replaced by others throughout the years, but always seems to come back with the most recent run being at Disneyland on August 2019 all the way to September 2019. On September 6, 2003, Marcelo Torres was riding in the front of Disneyland's Big Thunder Mountain Railroad attraction when the ride somehow became loose and the very front locomotive ended up hitting him right in the chest and head, killing him on the spot. Another 10 riders on the same locomotive, ages ranging from 9 to 47, were treated for moderate to minor injuries at local hospitals. Paul Pressler was the former head of the Disney Store Lines, the head executive of Disneyland from 1994, and became the head of Walt Disney Attractions in December of 1998. He was responsible for a lot of major expansion projects such as California Adventure Park, Disney's Grand California Hotel, and the Downtown Disney Complex. In September 2002, Paul Pressler stepped away from Disney and took a chief executive position at Gap Inc. He stepped down from that position on January 22, 2007. Project Stardust is an ongoing refurbishment project at Disneyland Resort where instead of it being a simple refurbishment like painting some things up again, adding new seats or whatnot to the park, they go through the whole park and refurbish any little thing to make it better for people. Stuff like better stroller parking, more chairs for people to sit, better queue lines, instead of just a simple project, it's basically a park-wide project. It's basically a slow, heavy refurbishment rather than a quick paint job on some old stuff. Galway Green is a green paint color that was invented by Disney Imagineers to be the most bland paint color possible. Basically, if you're scanning your environment, you wouldn't notice the color at the side of your eye. Lots of buildings are colored this color so it doesn't distract you or be the main focus of your attention. For example, you know how you see lots of trees everywhere used to the green color? Well, you can hide a building in between those trees and your eye is less likely to catch it. Basically, just using your eye and how it catches different colors, like how you catch the color yellow so easily versus the color go away green. They also have a color called blending blue, which is basically go away green for the ground, blending blue for the sky, because blue sky, green ground, you get it. The Mine Train Through Nature's Wonderland was a railroad attraction at Frontierland at Disneyland which featured audio animatronic animals in a natural desert, kinda like a chill little ride. It was replaced in 1977 by Big Thunder Mountain Railroad which, let's face it, that rides way better. The Mike Fink keelboats were small boats that navigated the rivers of America at Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom. They were basically small boats that people could go in and kinda go through the artificial river. On May of 1997, one of the Disneyland boats started to rock to its side and it capsized, causing minor injuries to the people who were on it. The boat eventually returned as a prop on the Tom Sawyer Island and the Magic Kingdom version closed in 2001. There was no official reason given for the closure, but it's safe to assume because they were very old rides as the one in Disneyland opened on Christmas of 1955 and the Magic Kingdom one opened on October of 1971. 
Big Thunder Ranch was an attraction at Disneyland in California. They had an outdoor petting zoo, a walkthrough log cabin, and a variety of scenery meant to create the atmosphere of a western ranch. It was located in Frontierland near Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, of course. In January of 2016, the entire land was closed to make way for Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. The Matterhorn bobsleds, which were built together by Arrow Development and Disney Imagineering, was the first tubular steel roller coaster in the world. Speaking of aerodynamics, they were founded in 1946 and came into contact with Disney in 1953 when he was trying to build his theme park. They would go on to design many of the rides when the park first opened. As decades passed, they slowly lost their hold on the amusement park industry and filed for bankruptcy in December of 2001. Vacoma is another amusement park ride manufacturer who got their first step into the amusement park industry with help from Aero. The most famous rides that they've made at Disney is Big Thunder Mountain, Space Mountain, and the newest Tron light cycle ride at Shanghai Disneyland. Billy Hill and the Hillbillies were a music group that performed at Disneyland for 24 years. They would mostly perform bluegrass country-like music to the crowd to enjoy, but also mixed in a couple of rock and rap with it as well. On November 2013, it was announced that Billy Hill and the Hillbillies would retire in January of 2014. In late 2013, however, some of the members decided to make their own group called Crazy Kirk and the Hillbillies. They planned to have the same music comedy style and members of Disneyland's Billy Hill and the Hillbillies, but performing outside of Disneyland instead. They currently perform at Knott's Berry Farm. Push the Talking Trash Can was a robot-controlled trash can that would walk through Tomorrowland at Disneyland and Magic Kingdom. It was popular with park guests because, I mean, dude, it's a walking trash can in the park. That's pretty funny. You're gonna expect a bunch of Disney characters to see a trash can just walking around. Push made their first appearance in February of 1995, all the way up until February of 2014 when it was retired by Walt Disney World. Carnation is a cafe located on Main Street, USA in Disneyland, California. It originally opened up as just an ice cream parlor before venturing into more comfort foods such as fried pickles, waffles, Walt's chili was one of the items which was the actual recipe that Walt Disney used when he was alive. Basically just junk food heaven. Walt Disney's college program sounds like what it is. You get your college tuition paid off so long as you work at Disney. You had the choice of one of four complexes until they were closed in March 2020 due to the worldwide issue at hand. As recently as June 2021, the program was confirmed to be coming back to Orlando, but there's no news whether it'll be coming back to Anaheim. The no one dies at Disneyland rumor basically has to do with let's say someone has such a bad accident that would certainly kill them, Disney would somehow keep them technically alive up until they stepped right off a park property, then they would die. Obviously we know that's not true because of the two stories we went over earlier, but it's one of those weird rumors that kind of goes around. Mr. One Way is said to be a ghost haunting Space Mountain at Disneyland. Apparently you run into him, he's not wearing clothes that look up to modern standards, and the next thing you know he's gone. That's literally it. It's probably just one of those rumors to keep kids on their toes and to spook them out as they're waiting in line because those lines can get very, very long. On Main Street, USA, Disneyland, California, there is a half red, half white light bulb. I find it funny knowing the perfectionism of all the Disney Imagineers that they just did this for the light bulb instead of just, you know, ordering it just a tad bit to the left for each other bowl, but hey, it works and people like it. In 1995, Tomorrowland started a renovation due to the fact that, even though the name is Tomorrowland, it was looking rather old. At first, the land wasn't completely walled off to guests, but then around 1997, they completely walled up the entrance, so a lot of people were thinking, oh man, what are they gonna do? Are they gonna add a bunch of new rides? Are they gonna rebuild all this new stuff? Basically, people were excited. Then comes 1998, the land reopens, and people realize that, except for the new ride, the Rocket Rods, everything was basically just a really expensive paint job. To put it bluntly, it sucked, people didn't like it, and it was an outright failure. By 2005, Tomorrowland was re-innovated once again, this time bringing back some of the old color scheme that was before and mixing it with the 1998 re-innovation to make what it is today. On January 4th, 1984, Regina Young was riding the Matterhorn bobsleds ride when she somehow became unstrapped and fell onto the track getting hit by another sled, killing her. Nobody knows how she got out as the sled was unbuckled but not broken when it pulled back up to the loading dock. Nonetheless, Young's family filed a suit against Disney in February of that year for $5 million, and in 1988 of March they finally won the lawsuit against Disney, getting that $5 million. Thomas Guy Cleveland was a 19-year-old guy who was killed when he attempted to sneak into Disneyland along the monorail track. 
He scaled the park's 16 foot high outer fence on the grad night and climbed onto the monorail track intending to jump down or climb down once he was inside the park. He ignored a security guard's shouted warnings of an approaching monorail train and failed to leap clear of the track. He finally climbed down onto a fiberglass canopy beneath the track, but the clearance wasn't enough. The oncoming train struck and killed him, dragging his body 30 to 40 feet down the track. The rocket rods were the ride that replaced the people mover system at Disneyland. Basically, think of it as a fast people mover system, instead of it being the slow sightseeing attraction where people kind of just rest, it was supposed to be an actual ride. It was met with mixed reception with some people liking it, but the main issue is that it was constantly down for repairs. The ride only lasted from its opening on May 22nd, 1998 to September 25th of 2000 because of the constant maintenance that had to be done. As of today, the People Mover and Rocket Rods track still sits dormant at Tomorrowland with no known plans of what they're going to do with it in the future. On June 22, 1973, 18-year-old Bogdan Delarue and his brother Dorian were visiting Disneyland. They were on the Tom Sawyer Island and it was getting ready to close so they decided to stay on a bit longer. While the staff escorted visitors onto the boats to return to the park, Bogdan and Dorian jumped a fence and hid in the woods behind the settler's cabin. At 9.30, they decided they wanted to leave the island and go back to the main park, but they didn't want to get in trouble, so they decided to try to swim across the rivers of America. Dorian didn't know how to swim, so Bogdan tried to carry him across the river, but about halfway through, Bogdan slipped and drowned. Dorian was able to doggy paddle until a staff boat spotted him and helped him up. Bogdan's body was found later the next morning. We do know that the Delarue family did try to sue Disneyland, but it is understood that Disneyland was cleared of any wrongdoing as it was the two kids who decided to hide out and break the rules in the first place. So right around when the Pirates of the Caribbean ride was basically finished, they gave Walt Disney a walkthrough and he loved it. However, the design team was disappointed by their fake skeletons that they used and they wanted it to be a bit more realistic. So they hit up some of their friends at the UCLA Medical Center and got some props from them from the anatomy department. As years progressed and like technology improved, they were eventually able to replace these real skeleton bones with the fake ones, but apparently there's still maybe one or two remaining on the ride, nobody knows for sure. The Disneyland of Walt's imagination is a giant model of Disneyland that includes attractions that either existed or were in development during Walt's lifetime. The model was made in pieces like a puzzle, started with Frontierland and working all the way up until Tomorrowland. It's a massive model and there are plenty of other pictures on the internet if you just google it. So the Society of Explorers and Adventures is this sort of background story that kind of ties some Disney attractions together, like a sort of easter egg of sorts. There is a lot going on here so I'm going to try to tie it together as quickly as I can but I do suggest looking into this more because it is kind of interesting. So it was inspired by the Adventures Club at Walt Disney World's Pleasure Island, but didn't make its first official appearance until Tokyo Disney Sea opened. One of the attractions at Tokyo Disney Sea was the Fortress Explorations, which gave the whole backstory to the Society of Explorers and Adventures. In fact, the Tower of Terror ride at Tokyo Disney Sea is actually themed after one of the members in his New York waterfront mansion, rather than the Twilight Zone theme that a lot of people know about. The Mystic Manor ride at Hong Kong Disneyland is centered around another member of the club, and at Walt Disney World during the 2013 refurbishment of Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, the two owners of the mineshaft are also members of the club. Even on the Disney Cruise Line, there's an Oceaneers Lab exploration area for kids, and it is themed around another club member named Mary Oceaneer. Basically, the Society of Explorers and Adventures kind of ties all the theme park rides together and that's really interesting. I never even knew about this until I started doing research for the video. Former First Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union Nikita Khrushchev took a trip to the United States on September 15th in 1959 to have a meeting with President Dwight D. Eisenhower. The meeting was going well as they took him on a tour through 20th Century Fox Studios in Hollywood, but things began to unravel when 20th Century Fox President Spiros P. Circus made some remarks to Khrushchev about the Soviet Union and how capitalism will be overall. Khrushchev and his famous temper started to flare and he claimed that Circus' remarks were part of a campaign to heckle him during his trip to America. Khrushchev only got more upset as on September 19th he found out that he would not be able to visit Disneyland as government authorities feared that the crowds would pose a safety hazard. So yeah, the president of 20th Century Fox basically ruined Khrushchev's trip to the United States. 
Disneyland and Walt Disney World are the only two theme parks in the United States that have no-fly zone designations. Nothing can fly below 3,000 feet and within 3 miles of both parks. This right here is the official no-fly designation for Disneyland as well, so good luck to reading all this. On Christmas Eve in 1998, Luan Fee Dawson and his family were waiting in line to board the Columbia, a replica of the 18th century tall ship and one of the park's tamest rides at Disneyland. As the ship approached the dock, an employee flung the mooring line around the cleat on the still-moving boat. Under the strain, the bolt securing the cleat to the boat sheared off, hurling the piece of metal into the crowd. The cleat broke the worker's ankle before striking Dawson and his wife, and two days later Dawson was taken off of life support after being declared brain dead. The family filed suit soon after, and on October 5th of 2000, they officially settled with Disneyland over the case. While the settlement is still confidential to this day, it is estimated that they got about 20 million to 25 million after they settled. The Chicken of the Sea Pirate Ship and Restaurant was the Disney landmark from 1955 up until 1982, although they changed the name to Captain Hook's Galley when the Chicken of the Sea dropped its sponsorship in 1969. As the name suggests, it used to sell a lot of tuna stuff such as tuna sandwiches, tuna burgers, or even a tuna pie. In 1981, Disneyland began work on their new Fantasyland, and there were plans to move the pirate ship over to the It's a Small World Promenade. Unfortunately, they weren't able to, and by summer of 1982, they'd completely disassembled the entire thing. Disneyland Paris, however, has their own version of the Captain Hook Galley at Adventureland. However, it doesn't serve tuna sandwiches as the last one did, it just serves your basic theme park fast food fare of donuts and whatnot. The Pirates of the Caribbean ride was originally supposed to be a walkthrough wax museum, but after seeing the success of the boat ride concept of It's a Small World, Disney decided to employ the same exact ride system on the Pirates of the Caribbean. During the development of the Haunted Mansion ride, Imagineer Rolly Crump was spitballing a couple ideas around when he decided to make a sort of walkthrough showing off a bunch of weird artifacts. Walt Disney himself liked the idea a lot and it was initially supposed to be a sort of lobby area for the Haunted Mansion where guests would walk by and see a bunch of weird things on the walls, but as time went on it decided to become the main attraction. Unfortunately, due to Walt Disney's death, the entire project was scrapped and the main Haunted Mansion idea came to be. Trader Sam is a character from the Jungle Cruise attraction at Disneyland, known as the Head Salesman of the Jungle. He would appear at the very end of the Jungle Cruise attraction, holding some shrunken heads and asking the guests, two heads for the price of yours. Get it? Cause Head Salesman of the Jungle, selling shrunken heads, wordplay and puns, everybody loves them. When the Magic Kingdom Jungle Cruise ride opened, the original name of Trader Sam was actually just Chief, but then around the late 2000s they decided to keep it together and both of them were called Trader Sam. In the very recent refurbishment of the ride however, Trader Sam is nowhere to be seen being replaced with Trader Sam's gift shop. Will Trader Sam ever come back at one point? Nobody knows for sure but it's safe to say that he's probably gone. Harriet Burns was the first woman hired by Walt Disney Imagineering and she helped with many of Disney's projects. She helped create the Sleeping Beauty Castle, New Orleans Square, the Haunted Mansion and more land surrounding the park. She retired from Walt Disney Imagineering in 1986, was given her own window and display in 1992, and eventually passed away on July 25th, 2008, at the age of 79. In 1980, while at Videopolis at Disneyland, Andrew Exler and his male date Sean Elliott were escorted off the premises after security guards intervened on their homosexual fast dancing and told them, this is a family park, we do not put up with alternative lifestyles here. Andrew sued and the legal matter was dragged out into court for four years until May of 1984 when a superior court judge ruled that Exler's civil rights were impinged on by the guards. Just another instance of how the world was different 41 years ago. Here's a video of Pluto chasing a kid after the kid probably did something to annoy the dude in the suit and well, take a look for yourself. Man, imagine wearing that suit for hours on end in the humidity that is Florida. Oh my god. 
On September 3rd of 1994, 75-year-old Jochim Chi Tu jumped from his balcony on the 9th floor room at the Disneyland Hotel. There were two suicide notes found, one in English and one in Chinese, directing people to call a Southern California relative by their phone. The Carewood Pacific Railroad was a personal rideable miniature railroad that was in Walt Disney's backyard at his house. As a little kid, he was always fascinated with railroads and wanted to become a train engineer like his father's cousin who drove trains all around the entire country. Come the near future and Walt Disney, you know, the guy made Disneyland, he had a lot of money to spend, so he makes his own personal railroad in his backyard. Articles about the railroad appeared in several magazines and a bunch of people were interested in Walt Disney's personal railroad system, so they would go over to his house and he would invite them to ride it and occasionally drive the train. In early 1953, somebody was driving the train too fast and caused it to derail. It had its whistle broken and a jet of steam stretched across the ground, which mindedly burned a 5-year-old girl. Fearing any future accidents, Disney officially closed down the Carrollwood Pacific Railroad, and in 1964, the entire track was removed as well. John Hench was an American artist, designer, and director at the Walt Disney Company. He worked for them for 65 years, helping design many of Disney's attractions and theme parks. He also worked on a couple of animation projects as well. For example, he was one of the first people to work on Destino, a project which began in 1945 and was not completed until 2003. He was the lead developer on the hydraulic giant squid in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. He was also the official portrait artist of Mickey Mouse, painting the company's portraits for the 25th, 50th, 60th, 70th, and 75th birthdays. He led the design for Tomorrowland, the Adventureland buildings and walkways, New Orleans Square, Snow White Grotto, he designed Space Mountain at Magic Kingdom. Basically, the dude was busy during those 65 years at Disney. Hench would pass away on February 5th, 2004 at the age of 95. So a little known fact about Disney is that the trash cans are all located about 30 feet apart from each other. Now the story goes that Walt Disney and his team removed the trash cans on Main Street and were handing out candy and snacks to people as they entered, and they would watch those people eat the candy and eat their snacks and see how long it would take until they just dropped on the floor and it was about 30 feet. Also, another cool Disneyland trash can fact, they are actually the first ones to use the covering bin with the swinging lid, where you push it, drop your stuff in, and the lid comes back. I never knew that. They literally invented one of the most popular trash can receptacles ever. So a quick rundown of the Yippies. The Yippies are not your average angry political protesters. They would go out of their way to be more attention grabbing than most people. For example, one of the things they claimed they were going to do, they threatened to levitate the Pentagon by performing an exorcism on a makeshift altar outside the building to cast out the evil they felt resided inside. What I'm trying to say is they were very vocal against things that they did not like. On August 6th of 1970, the Yippies walked through the gates of Disneyland intent on having their voices heard. They were angry about Bank of America's involvement in the park, they were a sponsor of Disneyland and a supporter of the Vietnam War, but they were also mad about the overly restrictive park rules like the dress code. At the time, mini skirts on women and long hair on men were not permitted. Disneyland was prepared for the protesters, calling in 150 Anaheim police officers to help throughout the day in case things got a bit bad. Nothing was really happening till about 4pm when the Yippies got into Tom Sawyer Island and started to replace the Stars and Stripes flag with their own Yippie flag. They were also trying to get reactions out of the tourists on the Mark Twain Riverboat and the Mike Fink keelboats by chanting slogans like Free Charles Manson and Legalize Marijuana. Things got heated when somebody tried to take down the American flag at the Disneyland Railroad Station, and that's when a bunch of arrests were made, 23 in all. The park was closed early at 8pm instead of the normal scheduled 1am time as an attempt to control the pandemonium. This is just one of the very few instances where the Disneyland park had to close early. The Flying Saucers were a ride that opened at Disneyland on August 6, 1961. The way it worked is that you would get in your little saucer yourself and air from the ground below would push up and you'd be able to lean around and move going back, forth, left, or right. The ride was popular with guests, but it was closed on September 5th of 1966 with the reason being that the technology just wasn't that good and it was constantly breaking down and was said to be one of the worst maintenance headaches at Disneyland, so the technicians just called it. 
The idea of the flying saucers came back when Carzon opened at Disney California Adventure on June 15th, 2012. Luigi's flying tires was the same exact concept except more modernized. Unfortunately, the ride itself just wasn't that good, and Luigi's flying tires was permanently closed on February 15th, 2015. Fun fact, me and my family were actually there when Cars Land opened and I remember riding this ride. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Uh, we waited like three hours and only on there for like a minute. Um, I'm not exactly sad that it's gone, but hey, you know, 50 years later, they try to do it again. The World Clock was a landmark at Tomorrowland when Disneyland opened in 1955. It was a clock that would tell time of every single time zone in the world by the hour. When New Tomorrowland opened in 1967, the World Clock was gone and no one really knows where exactly it went. The World Clock would come back as a mural in the Innovations Pavilion at the Innovations Dream Home which opened May 2008 and closed February 2015. Old Fantasyland of 1974 looks relatively the same. The main difference is the obvious change of style as people wear new things throughout each decade and the fact that there are lots of things added in the future that weren't seen now. It's still interesting to see that the main part and what drove Fantasyland altogether is still the same today, even 47 years later. Rainbow Ridge is a fictional mining town that serves as the setting of Disneyland's Big Thunder Mountain Railroad and the previous mine train through nature's Wonderland attraction. You can see it in the backdrop of the loading area for the ride. In 1977, when the attraction was closed, much of the town was demolished for Big Thunder Mountain. A few of the buildings were retained, and the town was given the name of Big Thunder. In 2013, however, another refurbishment gave it back its old name of Rainbow Ridge. Cynthia Harris joined the Walt Disney Company in 1992 and held a variety of senior positions, such as Senior Vice President of Park Operations at Disneyland and Senior Vice President of the Stores for the Disney Store chain. She also served as president of Disneyland Resort, where she managed Disneyland and Disney California Adventure, as well as the resort's hotels and retail operations. She would then move on to work for the president of Gap's outlet division from February 2004 to May 2005. Retlaw Enterprises originally started out as Walt Disney Miniature Railroad as a way for him to manage the building of his Carrollwood Pacific Railroad. He changed the name to Walt Disney Inc. and soon started the Disneyland Designing and Engineering Division within it. They held ownership of the Disneyland Railroad attractions as well as the Mark Twain Steamboat. Eventually, the theme park design group became so integral to Disney's studio that they outright bought them and changed the name to Retlaw Enterprises, with Retlaw being the name Walter backwards. They just held a bunch of television stations and real estate holdings afterwards, and in 2005, they were officially gone. Ronald Reagan was an American actor and politician who served as the 40th President of the United States between 1981 and 1989. Although he didn't appear in any Disney movies during his acting career, he did host the grand opening of Disneyland in 1955. And as you could probably guess, he is one of the presidents you can see when going through the Hall of Presidents at Disney. Skull Rock is, well, a real life version of the Skull Rock that you see in Peter Pan. It was located right behind Captain Hook's pirate ship or the chicken of the sea ship that we talked about earlier. It was a Skull Rock that you would see and people would take pictures of. As we heard before, during the building of New Fantasyland, the pirate ship was taken away and so was Skull Rock. It could no longer be seen by anybody. However, there is a Skull Rock remaining in Disneyland Paris and you could walk in there and even take a picture inside of it which is pretty cool. Mark Maples was a 15 year old boy who was the first person who was killed at Disneyland. He was riding the Matterhorn bobsleds and at the very peak of the mountain he decided to unbuckle his seatbelt and attempt to stand up. He lost his bounce and was thrown onto the track below where he sustained major injuries and died 3 days later in a hospital. The Disneyland Dream Suite was a luxury apartment located in the New Orleans Square area of the Disneyland Park. Construction started in the early 1960s as Walt Disney wanted a bigger entertaining area for the various VIPs that came to the park. His own apartment already existed but it was too small to host elaborate events so he decided to have it made in New Orleans Square as it was a little bit less busy than the rest of the park. The project was going great up until Disney's death on December 15th of 1966 as many projects in Walt Disney Productions were put on hold or abandoned, including this one. In July of 1987 all the way up until August of 2007, the space housed the Disney Gallery where Gallery, Disney Pictures, you guys already know what to expect. 
Then October 2007, they announced that they would turn it into the Disneyland Dream Suite to live up to Walt's imagination of having a private apartment built at Disneyland and would be made available to randomly selected guests of the park. It was open from January 31st of 2008 all the way up until 2014 and has been closed since. Rocket to the Moon was an attraction that was supposed to show you what it would be like to fly to the moon and back to Earth. It was one of the opening attractions at Tomorrowland and was pretty popular with people as it's supposed to show the future of tomorrow, hence Tomorrowland's name. But as we've heard by now, lots of stuff in Tomorrowland was rather outdated quick as by the late 1950s, they already had people sent to space with normal looking rockets that you've seen today. Eventually, on September 5th of 1966, Rocket to the Moon was closed and replaced in New Tomorrowland by Flight to the Moon, which is basically the same thing except they added audio animatronics to it. The motorboat cruise was an attraction similar to the Tomorrowland Speedway where instead of it being cars, it was motorboats in water, and they were on a predetermined track as well. It opened up in 1959 and it was a pretty popular hit as it was a lot different than the rest of the rides as there wasn't much Disney memorabilia going around, it was kinda like just cruising through a river. It lasted all the way up until January of 1993 where it was closed permanently and the former loading area is now just a general sit around spot. The Midget Autotopia was the third Autotopia ride made in Tomorrowland following the original and the Junior Autotopia. While the name of the attraction hasn't aged very well, it was basically supposed to be for little, little kids. Think of kids who couldn't ride the Autotopia in the Junior Autotopia, you'd send them to the Midget Autotopia. It was very popular with young children, but it was replaced with another very popular ride for young children, It's a Small World. They closed the attraction in April of 1966 and paved the way for It's a Small World which opened on June of 1966. The Mile Long Bar was a bar located in Bear Country where the Country Bear Jamboree was. Basically, it was a bar that had a mirror which made it look as if it was a mile long going on forever. Despite its name, the bar never sold any alcohol, only the Pepsi products that Disney sold at the time. In 1989, they changed the name of the bar to Brer Bar, a reference to Brer Bear in the Song of the South. On September 9th of 2001, the building was shut down so they could use it for a new ride and as the new superstore at the end of the ride. Walt Disney World and Tokyo Disneyland also had their own mile long bar, which in both parks were formed to make a bigger cafe by combining the adjacent store next to them. So while the mile long bar doesn't exist anymore, the whole building still does. The Tahitian Terrace was a sort of restaurant entertainment venue that was located at Adventureland at Disneyland. Guests would be entertained by dancing people dressed up in floral dresses and whatnot as you would expect with the whole Tahitian vibe going on. It was very popular, but in 1993, they closed it and replaced it with Aladdin's Oasis, which was a similar idea with the whole entertaining people while they eat, but with an Aladdin theme instead. I even found a copy of the old menu dating back to the 1960s, and just look at those prices for all that food right there. This is theme park price food by the way, it's just crazy to see how much cheaper food was back then with, you know, money and inflation and whatnot. The Indian Village was part of Frontierland that was made to look like an Indian village. They had the Indian Trading Post, they had Indian War Canoes where it was a ride where you would just go on a canoe. It made sense to have the Indian Village as the 1950s was very popular with the whole western themed cowboys and Indians type of shows on TV. It opened up in 1955 and lasted all the way up until 1972 where the new land Bear County basically overtook it. I find it crazy that this even existed at one point. The 1950s were a very different time compared to today. The Rainbow Ridge Pack Mules were a pack mule attraction that launched when Disneyland opened. You would ride pack mules through Rainbow Ridge. It was cheap, it was effective, basically it got the job done. It was popular with people all the way up until it ended in 1973 when they replaced the whole Nature's Wonderland area with Big Thunder Mountain Railroad and Big Thunder Ranch. Holiday Land was a grassy picnic area located around the western edge of Disneyland where New Orleans Square is. It was referred as a lost kind of Disneyland because it had its own admission gate and would hold up to 7,000 guests. It was kind of like a giant park, I would say. It had horseshoes, playgrounds, a giant baseball field. You know, the giant park kind of feel. It was closed in September of 1961 due to a lack of shade, no nighttime lighting or restrooms, and lack that Disney flavor that you would come to expect. The land is now mostly used for show buildings for the Haunted Mansion in Pirates of the Caribbean. 
I find it crazy that this even existed at one point because it sounds just like a giant park but you'd have to pay money to go into, not to mention no restrooms. It's like you want people to not even go there. The Alpine Gardens came about in 1967 when the House of the Future disappeared, but they kept all the ponds and waterfalls, trees, patios, flower beds, all the nice stuff, they kept it there, so it's kind of like its own little corner of the park you would go to if you just wanted to chill. Sometimes they'd have character meet and grease to stir up some traffic, but it was generally just a chill corner of the park you would go, sit down, have a drink, just gather yourself together before you're ready to head on out. In 1996, Alpine Gardens became Triton's Garden, which was themed after Ariel and the Little Mermaid. And then in 2008, it became Pixie Hollow, where they would do a lot of Tinkerbell meet and greets in the area. Jean Lafitte was a real life pirate in the 1800s that Disney likes to use his name a lot for some of their rides. For example, in the Pirates of the Caribbean loading zone, Lafitte's Landing is the name of the area. In Disneyland Paris on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, a picture of him is shown to be auctioned off by the auctioneer as you pass by. In the 1990s at Disneyland, there was even a plan to have a sort of walkthrough attraction that would go from New Orleans Square, under the rivers of America, to Tom Sawyer Island. Kind of a reference of how Lafitte and his pirate crew would smuggle contraband all sneaky and whatnot. In November of 1999, along with the release of Toy Story 2, there was a Woody's Roundup stage show at Disneyland. So in the movie Toy Story 2, you guys seen how Woody discovers that he was part of a fictional TV show. This is like the stage show version of that fictional TV show. I also found it interesting how in the photos you can see her how they're dressed in a sort of 1950s black and white look to kind of, you know, represent the 1950s TV show cartoon which was black and white. That was a really neat touch. The final performance of Woody's Roundup will be on July 17th of 2000, only a couple months later, and it was replaced by Billy Hill and the Hillbillies. So the story behind the original Dumbo flying elephant was that when the ride was first being introduced, in the movie Dumbo there's that scene where he gets drunk and there are a bunch of pink elephants around him. There would be some pink elephants and then one gray elephant which would be the real Dumbo. Along the way Walt Disney himself decided, yeah it's a better idea to have everybody ride Dumbo rather than have people ride the drunk Dumbo. The ride originally opened with only 10 Dumbos, but they soon replaced a version that had 16 instead. It is also the only ride to be found at every single Disney theme park. Circa Rama is also known as Circle Vision 360, is a type of film technique where you'd have 9 separate cameras in like some giant circle, all showing the projections on 9 different screens. It was a very immersive way to have the entire room you're in filled with nothing but cameras so you can see whatever show you're trying to show. It was patented by Walt Disney himself and was first seen at America the Beautiful at Disneyland. The area now spaces the Buzz Lightyear Astro Blasters and you can actually find the original Circa-Rama camera at the Walt Disney Family Museum in San Francisco. There used to be a tobacco shop on Main Street USA. Of course in the 1950s, smoking was seen as a sort of luxury item, one of those things you would do if you're fancy and sophisticated. And then as decades went on, people discovered just how bad it really was. In June of 1990, the tobacco shop closed permanently. In its place, we now have a shop that mostly sells Disney pins. I still find it crazy how Disney had a tobacco shop in their park at one point. I guess that just tells you just how big smoking was back in the day. I mean, they don't even sell alcohol in Disney back then, but they sold tobacco. Fort Wilderness was part of the opening of Tom Sawyer Island on May of 1956. It was a rustic, realistically built fort to represent the early American frontier. People would be able to walk into each building, check out what's inside. Made of real wood, it was a real fort. In the early 2000s, Disney realized that Tom Sawyer Island itself needed a lot of attention. So they closed it in 2003 with the draining of the rivers of America. And then when it reopened later on, it turns out that Fort Wilderness was closed. In May of 2007, the entire fort was demolished and it was rebuilt in a way, but it's not open to guests and only really has restrooms on the outside of it. Fort Langhorn in Magic Kingdom is still open though, so for any of you fort explorers, I'd suggest going over there. Holiday Hill was a man-made dirt hill from all the dirt that they dug up while building the castle and digging out the foundation and whatnot. Disney liked it, but he wanted it to look a lot more nicer as it was just straight up dirt, so they added some grass to it, added some trees to it, and it looked pretty nice. By 1958, it was removed to make way for the Matterhorn. 
The Country Bear Vacation Hoedown was a vacation-themed version of the Country Bear Jamboree. Basically, the Country Bear crew was on vacation and they started singing and whatnot. It opened up in 1986 and wasn't as popular as the Country Bear Jamboree as people felt it didn't really fit the whole theme of the entire land and closed by 1992. The Country Bear Jamboree soon returned after the closure and has been around since. According to Wikipedia, Walt Disney originally wanted the Matterhorn bobsleds to be a more toboggan ride rather than bobsleds, but they found it a lot easier to introduce the bobsled theming to it. Lilliputin Land was a land that was proposed during the early stages of Disneyland's development. Basically, it would have been a land of a lot of miniature things. You know, miniature forks, miniature plates, miniature trains like Disney's train in his backyard. Disney liked miniature things a lot because he liked the attention to detail that went into it and wanted to share that admiration with other people. It would have been located between Fantasyland and Tomorrowland and would have been, as the name suggests, a land full of miniature things. Unfortunately, the land never came to be. John Newman Jr. was a 48-year-old businessman who jumped to his death from the 14th floor of the Disneyland Hotel on May 5th of 2008. He is one of three people to have jumped from the Disneyland Hotel. The final person will be David Dalage, who jumped on the 14th floor as well on July 8th of 1996. Los Angeles Airways was a helicopter airline that was founded in October of 1947. One of the destinations that it would fly to was Disneyland Resort in Anaheim. It was seen as an alternative way to get to Disneyland as when you enter LAX after getting off a plane, it is a very, very hectic place to be in, even today. The company would last all the way up until 1971 when, after a couple of fatal crashes, they couldn't get bought out by anybody and were forced to cease operations. Tales of Oak Finoki was a ride that was located at Six Flags over Georgia, but was based off of Walt Disney's Song of the South. It was open from 1967 until 1980, where it currently houses the Monster Mansion. It's crazy to think how this is an early example of Walt Disney's influence on another theme park company entirely. Jack Rather is best known as the man who financed and owned the Disneyland Hotel. Walt Disney asked him to build the hotel after Disney has exhausted all of his credit to build the Disneyland Park. Jack was like, sure, and it became an immediate hit for both people. Disney attempted to buy the hotel and he refused to sell it to them. He owned the building all the way up until his death on November 12th of 1984, and Disney finally acquired the Disneyland Hotel in 1987, when it purchased half ownership of the Rather Corporation, and then the other half in 1988, outright buying the entire corporation to get the hotel. Disneyland of 1953 So the story goes that on September 23rd of 1953, Disney was trying to set up a bunch of business people to hear his idea about a theme park. He was worried sick, he had no drawing of the theme park yet, so he decided to call up his friend Herb Ryman, and over the entire weekend for the next 42 hours, they spent all their time just drawing up what Disneyland would have looked like. A lot of what you see in Disneyland today even made the final cut, so Herb and Walt, they were in the zone that weekend. So Disneyland had its own TV show from 1954 to 1958 called Walt Disney's Disneyland. They would show teasers of what they were up to, new sections of the park they might have been opening up, things they were changing. It was basically like a giant advertising campaign for the Disneyland Park. The show would be retitled to Walt Disney Presents where they kind of, you know, pushed it a little bit, not talking just about the park, but general Walt Disney stuff in general. Stuff he wanted to talk about, you know, he liked the future, like he talked about the future. General Disney stuff, their first foray into major television. That show would be replaced with Walt Disney's Wonderful World of Color, The Wonderful World of Walt Disney Next, Disney's Wonderful World, Walt Disney, The Disney Sunday Movie, The Magical World of Disney, and The Wonderful World of Disney, which currently is still going on. Walt Disney was the first major film producer to venture into television. As you guys can tell by now, it was one of his smartest moves he ever made besides building the park. On May 1st of 2019, there is no smoking in any of the Disney parks anymore. You know how some theme parks have their smoking areas in the corners of the park that nobody goes to? Well, in any of the Disney parks, there are no smoking areas. There are outdoor smoking areas toward the outside where the security are, but that's as far as you can go. Edison Square was a proposed expansion to Main Street USA, which, by namesake, it would have been a lot of electric shows going on, showing the evolution of electricity and housing, showing off the future of electricity, stuff that Disney would have liked. The idea was interesting, but it was eventually scrapped for more better things. 
Liberty Street was yet another planned expansion for Main Street USA. It would have featured a mixture of several American cities as they existed during the nation's early years. Basically think of a really old building, and then a modern looking building, and then possibly a building of the future. You know, Disney showing off his general admiration for history and how the future goes. At the very end of the land, they would have had the Hall of Presidents, but as you guys know by now, the plan didn't really go through and the whole idea never came to fruition. At Disneyland, when Walt Disney World opened in 1971, Liberty Street was officially opened where you could walk through and see the Hall of Presidents like Walt Disney dreamed of. Muppet Land was a proposed Muppet takeover of Disneyland that was slated to take place during the entire year of 1991. They intended to have a story of Mickey Mouse and the rest of the crew taking a year-long vacation and letting the Muppets host the park for the time being. Unfortunately, things never came to be with the unexpected death of Jim Henson on May 16th of 1990 and all the changes were stopped immediately, ending with the collapsed sale of the Jim Henson Company straight to Disney. Heinz Haber was the chief scientific consultant to Walt Disney Productions, but before he went to Disney, he was a German soldier during World War II as well as a scientist right after the war. He was brought into the US during Operation Paperclip, which the aim was denying scientific expertise and knowledge to the Soviet Union right after World War II ended. Then in the 1950s, that's when he became the chief scientific consultant to Walt Disney Productions. He is best known for hosting the Disney broadcast called Our Friend the Atom, which explained nuclear fission and fusion in simpler terms to children. He soon went on with his life after Disney, and eventually passed away on February 13th, 1990. But yeah, Disney had a er, German soldier that helped promote the advances of nuclear technology to children in the 50s. The TWA Moonliner, sponsored by Transworld Airlines of course, is the red and white rocket ship that you saw outside the Rocket to the Moon ride that I showed you in part 2. It stayed at the park all the way up until 1962 when Transworld Airlines dropped their sponsorship and then the Douglas Aircraft Company swooped in and became the next sponsor. The red and white was gone and replaced with a blue and white look instead. The Douglas Moonliner stayed at the theme park for another 5 more years until 1967 when it was removed for the redesigned Tomorrowland. In 1998 however, Disney brought back a scaled down version of the Moonliner which brought back the classic red and white scheme except it's right outside the pizza port shop and is used to cool down guests as you can see in this photo right here. So hey, at least it lives on. The House of the Future opened up in 1957 and was sponsored by Monsanto. It was basically just a representation of what people in the 50s thought the House of the Future might have looked like. There was nothing else to it, it was just a little house you could look inside. The House of the Future was removed in 1967, but all the stuff around it, the landscaping, the waterfalls, they all stayed the same, and in the last video as we talked about it, it became Alpine Gardens. On May 23rd of 1996, McDonald's and Disney had a 10-year multi-divisional, multinational relationship effective January 1997, which basically means McDonald's food was at Walt Disney World land whatever they owned. Disney changed up some restaurants to accommodate McDonald's food. They're just pushing the whole McDonald's brand because it's McDonald's. McDonald's was popping. You want people to see, hey, y'all got McDonald's in the park. Shoot, let me go pick up some of that. On January 1st of 2007, however, Disney did not renew their contract, so for only a 10 period gap as the contract said, you had McDonald's food at Disneyland and Disney World. I actually remember this one time when I was a little kid. I found $50 on the floor at Disney World and we ended up getting McDonald's fries with it and bought some toys. It's so vivid in my head, I'm thinking about it right now. I still remember picking up the $50 bill. So get this, back when Disneyland opened in 1955, they had a bra and corset shop. It was right on Main Street USA, you couldn't miss it, but they sold women's underwear, basically, at Disneyland. And what's craziest of all is that they had a mascot called the Wizard of Bras that represented the place. The shop did not last long at all. On January of 1956, just half a year after it opened, it closed. The glass and china shops next door expanded and absorbed into the intimate apparel shop space, as it was called. The building still sits there today and is known as Fargo's Palm Parlor, but the doors are still closed and it just seems to be a corner of the park you go to when it's really hot and you're just trying to get out of the sun.
The Kaiser Aluminum Hall of Fame was a walkthrough exhibit featuring the best of Kaiser's aluminum products. You would walk through, you would see some of the products that Kaiser made out of aluminum, and at the very end they had something called the Time Sphere, which was a massive aluminum ball that projected images of 50s firemen and imagined futuristic spacemen all proudly using or wearing aluminum. And at the very end they were given a commemorative card showing their gratitude for them walking through the Museum of Aluminum. The museum is as boring as it sounds, and what's funny is that Kaiser actually wanted to get away from Disneyland themselves because they felt there was too much competition on Disneyland's TV show. And in 1960, they were able to pull out of the company once their five-year contract came to an end. Thankfully. Who wants to go to an aluminum museum at Disneyland? The Davy Crockett Frontier Arcade was opened in Frontierland on January of 1956 because it was rather a boring part of the park to go to at the time, and they wanted to spice it up a bit. Its main draw was that you're able to play classic arcade games featuring Davy Crockett and his animal friends, so kind of like a weird half store, half arcade, you can't add a third half, with Davy Crockett all in the mix. An actor dressed as Davy Crockett would show up and even play around with the children, so Davy Crockett was in the mix. It was actually pretty popular and lasted all the way up until 1987 when it was closed for good and now just a normal souvenir and gift shop takes its place. Cascade Peak was a fake 75 foot mountain that opened along with Mine Train through Nature's Wonderland and it was one of the things you would go by as you're going through Nature's Wonderland. Even though the mine train through nature's wonderland closed in 1977, the peak still survived another 19 years in the park. By the 1990s however, the once small moderate sized trees were basically overpowering the entire peak itself, not to mention the constant maintenance that it used to have, it wasn't getting it, plus the water damage from all the constant running added some extra damage to the structure. It was demolished in fall of 1998, and all that was left was just a mound of soil and some rock work at the river edge. The Hall of Chemistry was another attraction hosted by Monsanto as well. It was literally a Hall of Chemistry showing how beneficial all these chemically made products are. It was just as boring as the Aluminum Museum. Basically, the reason the Hall of Chemistry and Hall of Aluminum even existed was because money was running short and Disney needed some money to, you know, get the park up and running correctly, so he had to take these kind of county fair type exhibits for his theme park. In 1965, Monsanto added a third attraction, the Fashions and Fabrics Through the Ages exhibit, which talks about the history of fashions and fabrics. Boring. Then, somehow, after 11 years, the Hall of Chemistry entirely was closed and was replaced with the fourth Monsanto attraction, Adventure Through Inner Space. The Toy Story Funhouse was an attraction that opened at Tomorrowland in early 1996, and it was gone right before the summer season started that very year. It only had a funhouse, which I can't find any pictures of how it looked like on the inside, and it had a show on the outside that was just a quick little thing to entertain guests. The only thing that I could find of what it might have looked like on the inside is this list of the stuff right here. So, I mean, I find it crazier that I can't find any pictures of how it looked like on the inside. So for now, that'll be something we might find in the future. I mentioned a little bit about Triton's Garden in the last video when talking about Alpine Gardens. Basically, this was themed after the Little Mermaid that had Triton and Ariel, a Little Mermaid themed garden, basically. It was eventually replaced by the current Pixie Hollow, so no more Ariel, no more Triton, just a chill forest themed area that is more themed to the general Tinkerbell type stuff. Mary Blair was the artist that designed It's a Small World and had a bunch of murals outside of Tomorrowland and other rides that showed off her artistic talent. Back then though, her art wasn't treated as respectful as it is now. During the 1986 building of Star Tours, one of her murals is being seen destroyed by workers as they make way for a new one, and another mural in 1997 was outright built right over so while it wasn't destroyed, the preservation of it is probably not the best. Her largest mural however is not located at any of the Disneyland parks, it is located at Disney's Contemporary Resort at Walt Disney World when it opened in 1971. It continues to delight guests that pass by it, showing the timeless, classic art style that Mary Blair had. So the Order of the Red Handkerchief goes like this. In 1960, the Rainbow Caverns Mine Train was expanded and renamed the Mine Train Through Nature's Wonderland. 
The ride operators of the original ride, however, were considered some of the best in the park because they were able to ad-lib the entire ride themselves all without any sort of recorded audio and anything. When the attraction came back, they found out that lots of new people were hired as operators, but they wanted to feel special and to show their significance from the rest. So to stand out, they started wearing red handkerchiefs as part of their costumes. They were told to stick to their correct costumes, but not to be discouraged by park authority or whatever. They let the handkerchiefs hang in their back pockets to show others their distinct role among the normal cast members. By February of 1964, a charter had been made to bring in a select few of those original mine train operators together into a semi-formal organization known as the Order of the Red Handkerchief. Basically, it was a way for the old heads to show the newcomers that, hey, I'm the real deal, I'm the one who's better than you at this job. Still neat though. The storybook land Mugo Pine is the oldest tree at Disneyland. It is located at the storybook land canal boats and you can see it as you're going through the ride. It was moved from its original location, so while it's not the oldest naturally occurring tree in the park, it is the oldest technically in the park. In 1978, it was alleged that an employee playing Winnie the Pooh slapped a child and caused bruising, reoccurring headaches, and possible brain damage. The worker testified that the girl was tugging at his costume from behind. When he turned around, he accidentally struck the girl in the ear. At one point, the employee entered the courtroom after recess wearing the Winnie the Pooh costume and responded to questions while on the witness stand as Pooh would, including dancing a jig. Appearing in the Pooh costume showed the jury that the costume's arms were way too low to the ground to slap a girl of the victim's height. The jury acquitted the worker after deliberating for only 21 minutes. So this guy was being sued after they said that they slapped their child and he accidentally hit them after they were tugging at the costume. It's crazy that the dude went in in the costume i mean it makes sense going as the costume show that hey these arms are too long to reach the girl it's just funny to think about the jungle cruise used to be a super serious kind of cruise up until 1962 where they started adding a bunch of jokes and humor to it and it was for the better because the ride is pretty entertaining with all the funny jokes that the cast members say walt disney wanted to use live animals on the jungle cruise ride as he was talking about it though with the zoologist they were like yo walt these animals are mostly nocturnal, so the guests wouldn't even be able to see anything except for just a bunch of sleeping animals. So eventually Walt's like, alright, you know what, that's that. But for a little moment, they did have live alligators in the water, which is kind of scary to think about. So most people know about Disney World's Utilidor system, which is those underground tunnels that cast members walk through so that they don't see them walking around the park. You know, you see some dude dressed in Tomorrowland at Frontierland. It would take away from the experience. The idea came about after Disney saw a cowboy walking through Disneyland's Tomorrowland and felt that it was so jarring and it took away from the experience, but he wasn't able to make it in Disneyland already because everything had already been built. Eventually, when Walt Disney World opened, they were able to build the Utilidor system which has been used since the 70s. Now, Disneyland's Tomorrowland has their own version, which might be a nod to the fact that Walt Disney saw the cowboy at Tomorrowland, or maybe it was literally the only place where they could build a feasible Utilidor operation over at Disneyland. Eddie Soto was the former senior vice president of concept design for Walt Disney Imagineering. He got his first start in the theme park industry working at Knott's Berry Farm as an assistant project director and then worked for Universal Studios Hollywood and Six Flags as well designing rides there. He caught the eye of Tony Baxter who asked him to work for Walt Disney Imagineering and was hired as the show producer and designer for Main Street USA at Euro Disneyland. It was 1994 when he finally got the Senior Vice President of Concept Design designation and he helped make rides such as Indiana Jones Adventure for Disneyland and was directing the master planning of Tokyo Disneyland for up to three years. He left Walt Disney Imagineering in 1999 and in 2004 he started up his own Soto Studios Incorporated design firm where he currently sits as president. The Spirit of Pocahontas was a stage show which was based off Disney's new movie, Pocahontas. It opened up on the same day the movie released on June 23rd of 1995, but only lasted two years till September 4th of 1997. It was mainly just a show to promote the movie, as it was seen to be a rather enjoyable stage show, but judging by its quick two-year exit, it's safe to say that Disney was just trying to promote the movie as much as they could. 
Harrison Price was a research economist who specialized in how people spent their leisure time and resources. He guided Walt Disney in the setting and development of Disneyland and Disney World. He started working for Walt Disney in 1953, producing studies with the development of potential theme parks. He considered several locations in Southern California, but decided that Anaheim would be the best location considering accessibility, climate, and projected profitability. He even did research for a Disney park on the East Coast, including Florida, New York, and Washington DC, before deciding that Orlando, Florida would be the best site given its mild winters. It's safe to say that price is one of the main reasons why Walt Disney was successful in the theme park industry to begin with, as he chose Anaheim and he chose Orlando. Price would pass away at the age of 89 on August 15, 2010 due to anemia and old age. The Viewliner Train of Tomorrow was a miniature train attraction that opened up on June 10, 1957 at Tomorrowland. The ride was designed by Bob Gurr, and it was built to go along the edges of Tomorrowland and Fantasyland. The ride would only last a little over a year after it closed on September 30th of 1958 when construction on the Matterhorn bobsleds and the submarine voyage began. Eventually, the Disneyland monorail system took place of the Viewliner on June 14, 1959, making this ride one of the shortest lived rides in Disneyland's history. So we all know that the Sherman Brothers wrote the song It's a Small World, but did you know that the song is actually considered public domain? It was all because of a request from the United Nations Children Emergency Fund, UNICEF. The reason they requested Disney to not copyright the song is because the song had been seen as a part of a gift to the world's children, so they asked Disney to leave it copyright free, and Disney actually obliged. So whatever TV show, wherever you're at and you hear the song on, Disney doesn't get any money for that and they can't sue for people playing the song. It's one of the reasons why the song is considered to be one of the most played songs in modern history. So right after the Tahitian Terrace closed, Aladdin's Oasis took its place. During the two summers and on select weekend days, people will be able to enjoy Aladdin's Oasis feast and show. By 1995, it became just a full service restaurant, and by 1996, it was generally closed except during private parties. In 1997, the facility became a venue for storytelling entirely, no food service whatsoever. The storytelling venue will last a whole nother 20 years all the way up until December of 2017, when in February in 2018 they announced that it would be replaced with a new restaurant named The Tropical Hideaway. The Yacht Bar wasn't a bar that sold alcohol, it was a snack bar where you could get hamburgers, cheeseburgers, hot dogs, french fries, soda, any sort of junk food, you would go to the Yacht Bar. It originally opened in 1955 as a Yacht Club, but then they moved it to another location in the park in 1957 and renamed it to the Yacht Bar, where it lasted all the way up until September of 1966 during the new Tomorrowland renovation. It was replaced with the Coca-Cola Tomorrowland Terrace, which was basically a much bigger counter service food restaurant so that Disneyland could feed a lot of more people at once. The World According to Goofy was a parade that opened in June of 1992 at Disneyland and only lasted 5 months. Basically, it was celebrating the 60th anniversary of Goofy since its first showing in 1932. The parade looked to be a sort of remembrance starting from the very beginning all the way up until the current day of all the things Goofy had been in and the way that he views the world. It was considered very popular and lots of people liked it, but as I said before, it only lasted 5 months so it was just one of those things you had to experience yourself. The Pirates Arcade Museum wasn't much of a museum, it was an arcade located right outside the exit of Pirates of the Caribbean. It opened up along with the ride in 1967 and lasted all the way up until 1980 where it was replaced with the store called Pieces of Eight. It makes sense why. Arcade games started becoming a little bit outdated and so Disney wanted to sell more merchandise to make more money, you turn it into a store. On It's a Small World, there is a moon and a sun in every single room you grow through as the lyrics say themselves, there is just one moon and one golden sun. So next time you write It's a Small World, make sure to scan the room very carefully to see if we can find each moon and each sun. So since Tomorrowland is supposed to show the future beyond, part of it was designed to show the eco-friendliness of the future as well, as 80% of the plants in Tomorrowland are edible. I wouldn't recommend eating them anyways though, because they're probably full of pesticides as you gotta keep the plants nice for the people to enjoy.
In 1976, a woman sued Disney Parks Corporation because she claimed that one of the three little pigs at the It's a Small World attraction grabbed her inappropriately. She claimed to gain 50 pounds from the incident and sued Disney for $150,000 for the damages. The charges were soon dropped however after a photo of her with the three little pigs showed the three little pigs stub arms meaning that they couldn't have grabbed her in any sort of way. In August of 2012, a family claimed that an employee playing the white rabbit refused to hug or interact with their 6 year old son for racial reasons. They claimed that the character interacted with white and Asian children but not their child. Disney did offer an apology letter and park passes to the family, but they refused the offer and filed a lawsuit as Disney would not confirm whether the employee was still employed. The lawsuit was settled on December 30th of 2013. So Mickey Mouse Park was the original envisionment that Walt Disney had for an amusement park. The idea started off as a small Mickey Mouse sort of carnival, not much of a theme park but just a general better looking carnival as carnivals and parks at the time were seen as rather shady and seedy places where people would hang out and do a lot of unappealing things. What started off as a small railroad and a couple of rides turned into Walt Disney trying to buy 10 acres of land both north and south of his house, outright turning the carnival idea into a full-fledged theme park. In September of 1952, however, the Burbank City Council rejected Walt's proposal. As I said before, it became more than just a small little carnival, it became a giant amusement park and the city did not want to deal with all of that. Walt was frustrated but not defeated, and he soon started building his Disney Land Park in Anaheim, and we all know history after that. In September of 2018, Obama was doing a speech at Disneyland and he mentioned that, during his time in college, he was kicked out of the park for smoking on the Skyway. A few of us were smoking <laughs> on the gondolas. Well, no, no, these, these were cigarettes, people. As we're coming in, there are these two very large uh, Disneyland police officers. And they say, sir, uh, can you come with us? And they escorted us out of Disneyland. Even former presidents were breaking the rules when they were young. So we've talked about how the 1998 new Tomorrowland refurbishment was basically a disaster with all the rides that people liked either being extremely hard to keep together and everything else just being a really bad paint job. Well, there was one attraction, I guess you would call it, that a lot of people remember fondly and that was the Cosmic Waves. Basically, it was a ring of a bunch of water spouts that would shoot water pretty high up into the air and the whole point of it was to try to time when the spigots would go off so you could go all the way to the middle to move the giant granite ball around. It was seen as an inventive way to have fun as well as during the hot summers, people wouldn't mind getting a little bit wet while walking through the park. Just a year later by 1999 however, the spigots were a lot less powerful and it was rather easy to get to the middle and not get soaked, making the challenge of not getting wet a lot less fun and more of just a little monotonous task to, hey look I touched the ball in the middle, let's go. By 2002 there was no water at all, and then by 2005 it looks like they replaced the flooring where the spigots used to be and it was just general flooring with the ball in the middle of Tomorrowland. And then in 2009 Disney planted some trees around the ball so it's a little rest area where you would put your kids and they just move around a giant granite ball. So there are upside down orange trees planted at Disneyland. In the Jungle Cruise, there's a group of orange trees that most people wouldn't recognize because Bill Evans, the landscape architect, planted them upside down. He thought they looked good as exotic jungle branches and if you don't notice the branches looking out of place, I think he thought well. So remember the holiday hill, the giant piece of dug up dirt that turned into this weird man-made hill that lots of people used to go on to just to get a general chill, relaxed vibe? Well, during its time in the park, it also became known as a lover's lane, much to Walt Disney's dismay. Was this one of the reasons it was taken out of the park? Perhaps, because if Walt Disney didn't like it, you know well that his whole team is trying to make him as happy as they can and looking for any excuse to get rid of it. These are just the obligatory fake entries that some icebergs have, so let's go right over them. Walt Disney is still alive. As we saw earlier in part 1, Walt Disney was buried, we even saw his death certificate, so there's no way his head is frozen anywhere. Presler Harris Tape 
As we all know, Paul Presler and Cynthia Harris both left Disney for Gap, so it makes sense to put the two together. Is there a tape? Probably not. They're businessmen and businesswomen. They would get in a lot, a lot of flack if anything was revealed about their intimate lives. While Disneyland was never intended to be a sovereign city state, there is a video by the Defunctland channel that talks about a lot of theme park history and they go over Walt's original City of the Future plan for Epcot and it is very very interesting to hear what Walt originally planned for Epcot. Let me just tell you something, it wasn't originally a theme park. I highly recommend watching it if you're interested in any sort of weird politics behind the Disneyland stuff. Tony Baxter designed Tomorrowland 1998 while drunk. Perhaps he was, perhaps he wasn't. As we know by now though, it was mostly just due to last minute budget cuts that they weren't expecting. So instead of being an actual revamp, it just became a paint job. The addition of a water splash pad that had no water after a year. And then a ride that, while was interesting and people liked, was constantly breaking down and was gone within three years. That is all of the Disneyland Iceberg Explained. I don't want to see anything Disney related for a very long time now because this was a lot of stuff to go over. Very interesting, but man, I am completely burnt out on this iceberg video. I hope you guys enjoyed it though. I hope you learned something new about Disneyland and Disney history in general. Make sure to like and subscribe. And as always, with all that out of the way, I will see you guys later.